The first speaker this afternoon is Bernard, uh, who works in uh, NLP and uh, chatbots for a company called Preykelt in Johannesburg. And uh, he's going to be telling us about semantic concept embedding for a natural language FAQ system. Thanks, Bernard. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, a disclaimer, though. I only started coding Python fairly recently. Um, uh, actually, since I, I joined the, the fearsome team in February, um, I coded mainly C++ before that. And um, effectively, I'm only about 1 18th a Python developer, if you would, would measure in time. I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe it grows at a different rate later on. Say again? I'll have to calculate. It's probably the same percentage, I hope. Um, and yes, I, I do miss my C++ compiler, but that <coughs> leads into a Python coding tip. Um, I got to know this guy pretty well, initially. <laughs> um, what is the solution to this problem? A, a couple of guys mentioned it earlier today and yesterday. In, in, any volunteers? Yeah, um, it's of course, if you are a, a C++ or you were a C++ person, it's, it's of course type hinting and static analysis. So I can recommend doing that um, as we heard previously using PyLint, MyPy and Flake 8 really helps a lot as well just to make, make sense of your code. And of course then much less chance of horse head or something more severe. Um, some background on, I don't know who attended Nick's talk uh, just in the uh, previous session in the room downstairs, but maybe some background on what Fearsome Engine is. And um, it's um, a rapid, a, a, a platform for rapid creation of uh, chatbots. I know of you are familiar with chatbots, but it's a, a, a interaction, a, a text-based interaction, such as shown on the screen here, and it's usually mixed um, application type button interactions and natural language, um, typically to create a, a more natural or a, um, a more convenient experience for the user. And what I do is the natural language part of the chatbot. So the, the fearsome NLU component that we're building, um, it does intent classification, uh, form filling, FAQs, uh, basically any, anything you, you would need in a, um, or to develop a chatbot. So similar to a wet.ai or um, api.ai. And um, we make use of open source building blocks, obviously, when possible. The ones we use mostly is NLTK, um, Scikit-Learn or SKLearn, and PyTorch. I haven't used PyTorch a lot, but um, uh, one of the Facebook guys recommended it, and I must say it's, it's been working um, pretty well. We do also then develop our own algorithms as required, since we have local languages. Um, there are a couple of um, things that are, are unique to our scenario, and I'll show the multi-language semantic matching for FAQs and intents and things today. And we also have done some work on local language detection. And we do collaborate with CSR universities and students, so if there are any students that are interested in this, um, please approach one of us and um, we'd like to, to chat to you. Today, uh, this is a, a larger system diagram of the Fearsome NLU. I'm not going to talk about all of the aspects, and I don't expect you to, to even read all of the information here. just want to show that there's a layer where the data scientists and machine learning people would operate at the top. And typically, there's a single user environment and a multi-user environment that um, you would typically make uh, uh, use as a service or when you want to use the NLU as a service. And um, 
here we have um, a, a web API that the chatbot would end up uh, using. The scope of this presentation is then, I'll give you an overview of what is semantic concept embedding. Um, how semantic concept embedding is then used for natural language FAQs, which um, is the, the end goal for, um, or what we first use semantic concept embedding for. And I'll share you some results. And uh, I don't know who of you hit the abstract for this talk. Um, if you don't know this, this video, the Turbo Encabulator, um, go and Google it. My PhD supervisor at some point sent it to me. Um, I think his uh, medical doctor sent it to him when, he, when the, the professor tried to explain what he was doing to the doctor. Um, it then reminded him of this video. And uh, I'm convinced there's a, a recipe for a, a great technical talk in this video. And the, the abstract is uh, written along in the same style. Uh, also, a couple of people presented on NLP already, so I'll try not to repeat what they did. Um, if anyone would like more information, please just uh, ask me uh, during the presentation or afterwards, it's fine. Um, so semantic concept embedding, it, if I were to give you a sentence such as, where do I go to write to communicate, or how do I send a message? How do you measure the distance or the semantic relatedness between these two sentences? Um, because writing a communique um, kind of implies that you will send something, so it's fairly similar to sending a message. Uh, but if I were to give you two numerical vectors, it's now much easier to say if these vectors are, well, I hope to say if these vectors are close together or not. So the idea is to transform sentences into these vectors and then to create a vector space within which you can represent vectors and, and words um, in this form. The way that I'm doing it is just a superimposition of word vectors. There are uh, different ways to do it as well, uh, using a current neural networks and um, more deep learning approaches, but we don't have the data yet. So at the moment, we're focusing on the simpler approaches. And as we get more data, we can go to the more advanced um, approaches. And the um, distance metrics, you've heard some of the distance metrics being talked about. Um, Helga mentioned the cosine similarity that, that um, many people use. And then we've also made use of what's called the L1 similarity, or the L2, which is the normal Euclidean distance. Um, L1 is kind of the, the absolute value of the, of the difference between two, two vectors, component-wise. Um, so word vectors themselves are based on a what's called a distributional hypothesis. So it, it's quite intuitive. A word will be known or can be known by the company it keeps. So a word's meaning can be inferred by the context within which it is often used. And what is then learned is a, um, uh, a vector space that minimizes the cosine distance of the vectors of words appearing in the same context. So that, that cosine similarity is actually built in from the start, so that you can use it at the end again for simula similarity measurements. Um, the embeddings we make use of typically are Stanford's glove embedding and uh, Facebook's fast text embedding. Um, it actually, st the fast text one actually started at Google, but then the guy moved to um, Facebook, but continued publishing on it. So I guess it's technically Facebook and uh, Google's word embeddings. Um, on the Wikipedia site, on fast text Wikipedia site, I have something like 1970 uh, pre-trained word vectors in 1970 languages. Um, 97 languages. And I think um, of our local languages, they have um, quite a couple. So it, it helps to, to cold start a NLP system. These vectors, as we heard previously, have um, 
50 to 300 um, dimensions. Now, that, that's still a, a, a relatively small vector space compared to what's called a one-hot embedding, uh, where each word in your vo vocabulary is a dimension in the space. And as we saw earlier, you can, um, in an unsupervised way, learn all sorts of interesting relationships between words. So you can discover that the direction from man to woman is the same as the direction from king to queen. And remember, this is unsupervised, discovered from unlabeled text. So you can do this in English, you can do it in Afrikaans, you can do it in any language for which you have a uh, number of books or Wikipedia or any large uh, source of, of text. And you can even discover, discover things like uh, walking is to walk as swimming is to swim. So it actually gives you th this um, model of, of language from an unsupervised uh, training process. Uh, the manifold hypothesis, I, I don't know who's come across the manifold hypothesis. Awesome. It's, it's more than the previous conference I, I attended. So this says that real world high dimensional data, so real world data is typically high dimensional, but it tends to clump together into low dimensional spaces. And um, there, there's some argument about this, but this is probably the reason why deep learning works, because typically uh, real data uh, kind of automatically clusters into lower dimensional spaces, so you can fit a hyperplane and separate um, the classes quite easily. There are a couple of resources on the internet if you want to know more. You can probably just Google manifold hypothesis or um, I like this guy's um, posts typically and he had one on manifolds and topology. And then there was a presentation at a 2013 conference as well on deep learning for NLP, which um, discussed quite in depth the manifold hypothesis for, um, for NLP. And what, what this does is it kind of um, gives you a uh, clustering of concepts. So you can see concepts related to city in the top left kind of clusters together and concepts related to body parts or um, feelings on, on the right. They, they seem to kind of automatically group together from the context that the words are, are used in. And there was a, a very cool paper by Richard Saucer in 2013 as well, where he aligned a word embedding with an image embedding. And then you can um, extrapolate or, um, or match words, wor the word space to the image space. So if you say truck, for example, it goes and finds things in the image space that looks like trucks. And if you were to mention a word that is not mapped directly to an image, because of the context of the word, it would still find images that in the same space in the, the, the image space. And then we'll find um, those associations as well. It's called a zero shot learning, um, which is the ideal, I guess, to have a, uh, something that learns from, from zero data. Then from the abstract for, for the work, um, that we're doing on constant embedding, the, the only new principle involved, and that's kind of the, the way the guy speaks in um, that video as well, is that instead of using the mean of word vectors to create the sentence vector, uh, you kind of attempt to retain the, the dominant semantic concepts um, over all of your words. And um, the it, it's kind of related to max pooling that uh, you would typically use for convolutional uh, neural networks. And um, I can show a Python notebook at this point. Let's do this. Okay, so this is what a word vector looks like. Now I've used the 50 dimensional word vectors just so that we can kind of make sense of this graph and it doesn't just look like, um, or doesn't, that it doesn't, isn't too compressed. What we're seeing in the red is a reference word which is typically 
calculated by doing a um, principal component analysis or something on the data you have. So in this case, words like is and just and words that are, that are part of the, the structure of the language but don't really carry meaning of their own kind of introduces this um, principal component in, in your embedding, which you can then um, eventually subtract from from the, the sentence vector, but you can, for example, say the cat is, and then you'll get this blue, w blue which was the, the sentence vector, having some signal above your reference, which is your, your language structure. And then we can, for example, I'm going to take away the reference and just type Just type that, so that we have ha again I have two graphs, and now you can see the the red, which is the longer sentence, having some additional semantic information above the that first first part of the sentence. So it's not keeping an average over all of all of words. It's trying to keep the dominant um, semantic concepts, and we can go further. Cat is. So we again have two sentences, slightly different. And you can see that now, the in this case, the red is now the, the garden sentence. And again, it, there's some differences between the, the red and the, and the blue. So the cat is in the house and the cat is in the garden looks different. The numeric values are different, so you can tell the, the difference um, quite easily and measure using the cosine product or the L1 normal L2. Let's go back to presentation. So if we apply this to um, natural language FAQ, then you can kind of think how, how this would work. You would have a list of your frequently asked questions. You can compute a numeri numeric vector for each of these and then just search when you get the user input for the closest match in that list. And that's exactly what we do. Uh, I tried at some point in SVM to see if that's more accurate, but um, the K nearest neighbors algorithm is uh, the most accurate in all of these cases and we don't have that much data, and even if we have a lot more questions, there are ways of um, creating an acceleration structure, so your k nearest neighbors search is also uh, quite fast. Then what we end up doing is a language identification in front of your, or just before the FAQ system runs, so then you can run a different FAQ depending on which language you're speaking. Ideally, you would attempt to combine these language models so you just have one FAQ model uh, with all of the language embeddings um, aligned. But we're not quite, quite there yet. Um, there's not a lot of data for some of our local languages, but as we go get more data, all of this will, will, of course, improve. If you were to give questions to the FAQ system, it would look something like, you see there, you can say, um, how do I submit a claim? And that matches to some answer. You can do the same in a uh, different language, with a case insert. Now, I can validate Afrikaans and English quite easily. Some of the other languages I can't validate myself. So if there's any people in the audience that uh, are interested in NLP and can speak some of our local other local languages, please also come and talk to us. Um, we would be interested to be able to easily validate all of the languages during our development. And if you were to give it a sen sentence like, what will the price be, it would match, how much does it cost? Um, I can again show a uh, live, live sample. Um, I've pre-entered all of this, so I'm not going to stand here and type in a bunch of questions now. And then we can ask the system a question. Okay, that's just a training process. 
Um, that's just the, the model name, the, the PyCon FAQ. Then we can ask it, for example, is it expensive to get a quote? And then it matches, uh, the best question match was, is it free to get a quote? And it's about 46% confident that that is the correct reply. Al although for nearest neighbor search, the confidence is uh, not quite a, a statistical confidence. It's more of an indication between zero and one um, that you can compare the results. And the second best match was where can I get to get a where can I go to get a quote with a 0.21 um, match? And what we typically do is we present multiple responses to the user so that if the first response is not the best one, then at least the second or the third is also a, a, a potential valid valid response. Um, I can do the same in, say, another language. So what I'm showing y now here is in that first and second layer of that architecture diagram. So it's still the single user environment. It's not yet the, the web service. But the chatbot has a very similar interface that it uses. Um, and say, I'll do an Afrikaans sentence just so that you believe me. Let's, let's, let's do that. Sorry for the people that, that can't speak Afrikaans, but um, I'm sure there are a couple that, um, in this case, it, it only returns one match, Isakwatasi for neat. So it, it sees a semantic thing related to price, sees a semantic thing related to, um, well, in this case, it was only about price. Um, and then it matched it with a slightly lower confidence, but it's still the best match for this, this question set and this question. Let me go back. How much time do I left? <coughs> so the results that we're getting um, is, is quite good for a five. So I used the Cora data set that was released in February this year. They have a bunch of uh, questions is labeled with is it um, similar to another question in a database so you can kind of build up these groups of sentences that or questions that would all match the same answer and if you were to do a, a top three out of five thousand classification given three example questions uh, you typically get an accuracy of 92 percent and if you were to give it more example questions per FAQ so you have more training data effectively you get an accuracy of 95%, which still means you're, you're wrong one in 20 times, which is significant. So we want to get that more accurate. But we, uh, I implemented uh, a reference as well, which does um, vector weighting and also principal component analysis. And at least we score 2% better than, than they do. Um, and then there are other tasks as well. Um, there's a same eval task, which is a semantic relatedness, where it's just not just is the sentence is the sa are the sentences the same. It's actually giving giving a score of how related they are. So that's um, testing the system against human labeled uh, relatedness scores. And there we score a, a, a Pearson correlation score of between 0.66 and 0.72. The 0.72 is when you combine it with a uh, neural network uh, regression. So it's a, a kind of a semi-supervised um, result. Um, there we do not beat the reference, but I'm sure we can. I'm not sure why we don't beat them yet. Um, that's the end. Um, please get in touch. Uh, as my colleague see, said earlier, and I'm surprised not more people are saying it. I guess it's implied that uh, we're hiring. And um, if you want to experience the FISM NLU Playground service, so it's the, the chatbot facing API, you're welcome to send an email to us uh, or visit the website for, for more details. And um, any questions?
Thank you. Hi, thanks for, thanks for your talk. Um, what's your approach for dealing with the fact that sentences are different lengths? Um, um, that's part of the reason why we don't just take an average over the words. Um, so if you take an average, then you kind of dilute, say, an important words concept as you add more words to the sentence. Um, so this is not a convolutional approach, so we don't have to worry about having enough um, input uh, inputs to the network. But that is one of the reasons why we don't just take an average, why we take like the, the max out over the sentence. Um, hi, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering, um, I see uh, the talk kind of covers um, the, the natural language processing for Romanized um, languages. Uh, mm -hmm. How does this work for you know languages like uh, Sanskrit or, or Mandarin? Um, or do you have to first like Romanize the language and then? I, I know it's a lot different. Mm -hmm. So many of these approaches probably won't work, um, and that's why people are starting to rely on deep learning data, uh, deep learning uh, when you have the data. Uh, there's a um, kind of two sides to whether you must follow a linguistic or linguist's approach to this or whether you must just throw more data and deeper networks at, at the problem. But it, it is a, something you should definitely seriously um, take note of. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks Bernard. Um, I'm just wondering, so you mentioned your max out approach is kind of like a convolutional approach. Did you mm -hmm. benchmark against actually using 1D convolutions to encode the sentences? No. Um, as, as I said, we're struggling to get, to get data for the, the tasks that uh, we are actually um, tackling. But it is something we, as we get more data, that, that we'll look at. The, the max out approach or that taking the note of the uh, maximum, uh, maximum power semantic concept mm. is similar to max out, but mm. that's not the only place that max out is being used, of course. And, and have you looked at uh, generating data? No. no I, I know people kind of take um, input data, input sentences, and then using word vectors, I generate new sentences around your, your input sentences. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm not sure if that actually gives you better results than just using a different classifier. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, ev even generating like fact question answer pairs. Um, uh, generating by human effort or by? Like, yeah, well, using examples, you can like pose questions. So I I if you, uh, what we typically do is if, if we have to do an FAQ, we start with a question list and then humans, uh, people, add more questions around the various questions. Okay. But if you were, you, you were to use a, your trained model to do that, then I'm not sure you're actually adding information to your training data. Yeah. I suppose you could do like a GAN approach where you try to generate yeah. good questions. And then th th that, yeah, that's something that, that's quite interesting, which I haven't tried, but um, using some adversarial approach on natural language processing, I think could be quite interesting. In your example, you, the, if, you, if you had the FAQ question, is it expensive? And the answer was just yes or no, so I say it was yes. Um, and you match, be because, because of the way your embeddings works, that matches quite well with is it free? Mm. So it gives you then, it would give you then exactly the wrong answer, even though it's a close match. Because do you, do you have problems like that where, where because the concepts are related, it's, yeah. it's close, but the, because they're opposites, it, it, does, it gives you a very wrong answer. Yes, so in, in the FAQ, and that's why I kind of started with it, we can kind of abuse the fact that cheap and expensive matches. Because if you ask a question about cheap, 
it matches the questions about expensive, and that's, that's probably fine. But um, in more complex uh, tasks, you probably need to take account of whether you are on the expensive side or the cheap side of that concept, f for example. So it is a concern, but um, not, not for FAQs so much. Even if, even if your FAQ was, is it expensive? Yes. And then it matches against... Yes. So you, you must be aware of it when you design the questions, yes. of, of course, yeah. Can I just ask another question? Um, the because you're using <coughs> K nearest neighbors, how do you decide when you simply don't, the, the match is not good enough? That's a very good question, and it was so one of the problems we solved last. Um, it, uh, K nearest neighbors is kind of like a, a Voronoi classifier, effectively. So if you look at the distances to your, your different potential matches, if those distances are all kind of equal, you know if you're far away from everything and it's probably not a good match. But if there's one that's significantly uh, shorter, then it's a, a good match. So that's basically the approach that, that we use. But yeah, that was one of the more difficult problems. Any further questions? Okay, great. Let's just thank Bernard again. Thank you.